I don't know about you, but I'm feeling 22. U.S. National Parks! Good, Good morning, morning from, from Key, Key West. West! Early morning from Key West, it's 5 a.m. We're Massa and Ivan, and today's my adventure is going to Dry Tortugas National Park. My 22nd U.S. National Park. It is the most money I have ever had to spend to get to a national park, so this place better be incredible. Also, it is 5 a.m. right now. So, I mean, the fact that I have this much energy should show you that I am incredibly excited, uh, but also, like, it better be good. Waking up at 5 a.m., spending this much money, I got high hopes, but it better live up to them. <laughs> West. At 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> My parents are also adventuring with us today. Dry Tortugas is 70 miles off the coast of Key West, so you can only get there by boat or seaplane. If you don't own your own boat or seaplane, the cheapest option is the Yankee Freedom Ferry, and check-in for the ferry is at 7 a.m. It costs $200 a person. But we have the National Park Annual Pass, so that did save us $15 a person, which made the prices a little less painful. I thought at this price, it wouldn't be very crowded. I have a goal of visiting every US National Park, and even I found it hard to justify spending this much money to do so. But I was really very wrong. This ferry was completely sold out for months when I first went to book. And luckily, just a few days ago, a group canceled and we were able to grab their spots. After around two and a half hours on the ferry, we have made it to the park, which you may have noticed is home to a massive 19th century fort, Fort Jefferson. Included with the ferry ticket, we get the bagels you saw earlier, lunch, water, and a guided tour of Fort Jefferson. As the third largest and the most powerful fort the US had ever built, it seems pretty crazy to find it way out in the Gulf of Mexico, especially when you consider how insane it would have been to build this in the early 1800s. There are no real construction materials on these islands. The majority of materials we see were shipped in on wooden boats from the Northeastern United States, meaning weeks of travel for it to even get here. So why, when it's so difficult to build anything out here, did the US decide to build the most powerful fort in the country on an island where one could presumably sail around the range of the cannons? Three reasons, a deep water safe harbor, plentiful sea turtles for eating at the time, and the Gulf Stream. To this day, ships use this safe harbor to escape storms and the Gulf Stream to travel from this side of the world to Europe. And both of those things will take you right up here within range of this fort. The range of this fort's over 420 cannons was three miles in all directions. This fort is being designed to fire 125 cannonballs a minute at a target, regardless of the direction of approach, and the targets we're firing at are gonna be large, wooden, <laughs> slow-moving targets, right? and they would essentially never be exposed to fire from attackers because of the Totten shutters, which were designed to blow open when the cannon was fired and immediately slam shut. A very cool high-tech, low-tech creation that would keep the soldiers safe. But these didn't prove to be overly useful because only one engagement ever happened at this fort on January 19th, 1861, and there was no cannon fire involved. On January 10th, Florida seceded from the Union and joined the Confederacy. At this time, the fort was still being built, so there weren't any military men here. Immediately, the Union Army sent 66 soldiers from Boston out to the fort to protect it. They arrived the evening of January 18th, and the very next morning, a small Florida ship pulls up, docks at the fort, and the captain demands the surrender of Fort Jefferson to the state of Florida. If the ship had just come 24 hours sooner, he would have easily taken it with no military men there. But the Union Major marched out and said, the only reason I didn't blow your ship out of the water miles ago was so you could deliver a final warning to the Confederates that if any Confederate ships come out here, we're not firing warning shots, they'll be sinking. None of their cannons had even arrived. It was all a total bluff. 
but the Florida ship set sail and the fort remained in the Union for the rest of the Civil War. Florida seceding from the Union is also the reason the walls change color on the third floor. The bricks of the first two floors are from Pensacola, Florida, but the third floor bricks were shipped all the way from Maine. The main use of this fort was actually as a prison. The most famous prisoner being Dr. Mudd, who set John Wilkes Booth's broken leg while he was on the run from the assassination of President Lincoln. During Mudd's imprisonment, everyone on the island was getting sick. The majority of doctors and nurses there had died. And Mudd ended up providing care for his imprisoners. Thanks to his care, the mortality rate for yellow fever on this island was less than half what it was in other places in the country at the time. Grateful for the lives he saved and the compassion he used in doing so, President Johnson pardoned Mudd from his life sentence in 1869. The history of this place is so fascinating, but 99% of this national park is underwater. So after a quick lunch, it's time to dive in. There's several snorkeling spots at the park, and our guide said the best spot really depends on the day. So the beauty of going snorkeling in the afternoon is that lots of people have already finished and can tell you the best spots of the day. And by the time we went, we got this area all to ourselves. I'm sorry it's a little shaky here, but holy cow that fish is as big as me! There are so many beautiful fish. This competes with the snorkeling we did at Isla Mujeres last year, and without a doubt is the best snorkeling we've ever done in the United States. Oh, so beautiful. Was it fun? Yes, quite the adventure. Sadly, our boat leaves at three, so we have to start heading back to rinse off and change. If we come back in the future and plan far enough ahead, I would love to be able to camp here. I could have spent so much more time exploring the fort and snorkeling. This place is just so incredible and beautiful. For those reasons, even though we spent less than five hours here and had to wake up at 5 a.m. to do so, it was worth it. I mean, for starters, look how big these boat bathrooms are. That's fancy. And the boat ride included breakfast, lunch, the boat rides, history tour, snorkel gear, and the chance to enjoy this underwater paradise. It has been an absolutely incredible day, and I'm so thankful I got to explore this unique national park with my family. Most national parks that I've been to are more nature focused, so getting to experience both the absolute incredible beauty of nature along with the history tour was super cool and unique. And if you come out here, I highly recommend you take the long history tour. We still had plenty of time 
to go snorkeling afterwards. Thank you so much for joining us as I work towards one of the maddest adventures on my heart, visiting every U.S. national park. Please hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. They seriously help us so much. Join us on the next one as we head to the most magical place on earth. And until then, live your own magical adventure.